wearing a fantastic bouquet of Cascade hops and has a beautiful deep gold color and a wonderfully pronounced hop flavor. And this week's beer was brought to us by these beautiful creatures. First up, we have Lonnie and Sedona Woolley, Washington. And a big shout out to Rachel and Amy in Lincoln, Nebraska. And let's go all the way out to Wellington, New Zealand and say hi to Lucy and Charlie, who says true crime and chill forever. And a big shout out to Richard in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And a cheers to Tracy from Dallas, Texas. And last but not least, Robert, who is on the road trucking in the Netherlands. Thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And while you're over at the website, make sure you sign up on our mailing list because we do send out notices about when we have sales on something on the website. You get to know first. That's right, Captain. That's enough of the business, everybody. Gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The Great Smoky Mountains are a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in southeastern United States. They are a sub-range of the Appalachian Mountains and form part of the Blue Ridge Physiographic Province. The range is sometimes called the Smoky Mountains, or simply the Smokies, due to the frequent fog that covers the mountains and which looks like smoke from a distance. The Smokies are covered with drainages, eroded by creeks, with many giant boulders, as well as steep cliffs cut with crevices. The landscape also features thickets of trees and vegetation that can trap you if you stray from an established trail. The thicket can be so thick that in one case, it took over a year to find an airplane. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to locate a single person given that type of terrain. Roaring rapids, especially after heavy rain, could drown out sounds of screams or crying. Wild cats, black bears, and a couple of different poisonous snakes are a rare but dangerous sight. In springtime, hungry bears come out of hibernation and they are at their most dangerous as there isn't much food. But even in the summer, they can, if provoked, attack people. With millions of visitors annually, it is no surprise that some people get lost in the wilderness of the Smokies, but they are typically located within 48 hours by dedicated rescue efforts. What is surprising is just how many people have come to visit, only to never be seen again. These mountains keep secrets. There have been a number of mysterious disappearances and deaths that are as bizarre as they are unexplained. This is one of those stories. Friday, June 13th, 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin was on his first overnight camping trip. This was part of a long-standing Martin family tradition of Father's Day outings in the Smokies. With him, his nine-year-old brother, Doug, his father, who was a Knoxville architect, his name is Bill Martin, and his grandfather, Clyde Martin. The group spent the first night in a location called Russell Field and they camped with Dr. Carter Martin of Huntsville, Alabama, and his two sons. Russell Field is a grassy clearing in the forest with a panoramic view across the Smokies. The next day, June 14th, the group went east 
on a 90-minute walk to a spot called Spence Field. Some quick specifics of Spence Field, there were two shelters located there. Now, the Appalachian Trail runs east and west through Spence Field, and there were two trails and one Jeep road that lead to and from Spence Field to other destinations. There, at approximately 4.30 p.m., the four boys were playing a game of hide-and-seek in a grassy area of Spence Field, and they thought it would be funny to hide and then sneak up and scare the adults in their group. Douglas and the other two boys went south and then west. Little Dennis, by himself, headed for a spot to the northwest towards the Appalachian Trail and into the forest. Yeah, and he went into the forest, but his father saw where he went to hide. Literally, a few minutes later, the boys jump out of the woods, you know, in an attempt to scare or startle the adults. Ah, gotcha. However, Dennis does not jump out of the woods. Mm. He does not appear, and he was nowhere to be seen. Very shortly after, the adults would estimate 10 minutes, so at approximately 4.40 p.m., just a few minutes had passed without anyone spotting or hearing Dennis. His father, Bill Martin, was calling out to Dennis and looking for him, obviously. Bill then followed the Appalachian Trail west for about a mile before heading back, and then he headed west again, this time all the way back to Russell Field, only to return alone to Spence Field, and there's no sign at all of Dennis. There was nothing of his that was found during this quick search. While the boy's father was making his journey, the grandfather, Clyde, made his way back down Anthony Creek to Cades Cove, roughly eight and a half miles, and reached the ranger station shortly before 8.30 p.m. This was to summon help, and at this point, it began to rain very heavily with a very nasty storm. Well, every parent will know this is your worst nightmare. You could be in the grocery store, and you turn, Mm -hmm. and your child's not there, and it's like your heart sinks all the way to the bottom of your gut. Well, and I want everybody to kind of picture this, okay? Because I think it's easy to work through this. And I tried to find an exact time that they had left when they woke up that morning and took off on that 90-minute walk east. I couldn't find an exact time. My guess is it would be sometime that morning. They'd make this walk. It's about an hour and a half walk. They're there now at this new spot, and they've set up camp. They've spent the day setting up their camp. Right. This is the time where we're relaxing. We're chilling out. The kids are playing. You know, There's no work to do. We're just going to hang out and chill. The kids are playing this hide and seek game, running in and out of the woods, running around, having a good old time. Now they come up with this idea to kind of prank the, the parents, but what's weird. And one thing that I can't like get over, like when we cover cases and there's those moments where you wonder if, if other people feel guilty about something or if somebody second guesses one of their own personal actions for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. The moment for me is this. We have four boys. Three of them decide to hide together in an area. And one boy, he's only six. Dennis is only six. He's hiding by himself. Now, from what I could find, Captain, it seems like Dennis was wearing a, we know that Dennis was wearing a red shirt. And what it seems like is that one or all of the other boys had suggested that Dennis go hide by himself because he could be easily spotted with his bright red shirt in that area. Mm -hmm. So he's off hiding by himself. These other three boys are all together. They jump out and it's like, you know, at first it's probably like, oh, you know, you got me. And then you kind of wait and you wait and wait, you know, where's Dennis? Why is he not with you guys? Right. And then the boys are saying, hey, he went over that way and he hid by himself. And now dad and grandpa are out walking around calling for Dennis's name. You you know how it is. You just explained it right there. But when you call out your child's name, when you scream, at, hey, Dennis, you know, you expect him to come running out or at least hear him call back to you. Well, and like I said, there's multiple reports that say that Dennis's father saw him go into the woods kind of watched where he's going to go hide. Like, mm-hmm. that's where he's going to go hide. And then obviously, because they're playing a game, you you pull your eyes off of him. 
Right. And I guarantee you that he sees that image of his son going into the woods over and over and over in his mind. Well, and you never think, you never would expect to look away just for seconds, maybe a minute or two, and then they're gone. Right. And so let's walk through this because the official search would begin Saturday, June 14th at approximately 8.30 p.m. This is after the grandfather notifies the park rangers that, hey, my grandson's missing, and we've been looking for him, me and his father, as well as other people, and we can't find him. And obviously, they have some things working against them because of the time this took place. They didn't have cell phones to make calls. I don't even know if cell phones would work there now, but some way to alert people and stay in the area and have you know the dad, the grandfather, the kids searching why they have help coming to find you know help find this kid. So from the the start of this search at eight thirty, we have three rangers from Cades Cove that are checking trails to and from Cades Cove all the way out to Spence Field, and anybody that they come across along their way, they're going to. You know, some have said interrogate, some say question, whatever. Right. But any hikers or anybody that they pass on these trails, they're going to ask them, hey, have you seen a boy? What have you been doing? You know, where were you at this time? Right. So on and so forth. And this produces Spread them. This produces nothing. Now, the other thing we have to keep in mind, though, is there's a heavy rainstorm. And when I say heavy rainstorm, I mean two and a half inches of rain fell. And this occurred at dark. All the streams became very high and turbulent at this time. And the three rangers, the family members of the Martin family, they continue to search the immediate area for the rest of the night. The results were negative. Not only did they not find Dennis, they didn't find any clues to suggest where he could have been, where he was hiding. So the day that Dennis goes missing, we have three rangers looking for him, plus the family, and plus, I, I believe, the other uh, Martin family is helping search for him as well. Yes. And we also have other people that are camping in the area that are assisting the family and the Rangers, because that's how this works. You know, when the Rangers come across other campers, they're saying, Hey, this is what we're doing. We're looking for a little boy. This is what he was wearing. His name is Dennis. And can you help us search from the get go captain? We're going to be dealing with several, what I would call major issues in the investigation and search for this little boy. The first being the obvious, the the rough terrain, as well as the two and a half inches of rainfall that night. Yeah, This does not help you find anybody, and it also does not encourage others to join in on the search. Well, and these are very thick woods as well, so it's not like you can look into the woods and see a couple, even houses back. You're not, you're not even going to be able to see that far back. What we're going to see take place is a massive search effort. And the other thing that I would say is a major problem in this case is it's, it's very important to note that the park itself had no detailed search and rescue plan in existence at this time. And what I mean by that is those three Rangers that went out looking and assisting the family and other campers looking for that little boy that night, that was as much of a plan as they had. Okay. Somebody gets lost. We send out a few guys. We find the person. It's all over with. Don't worry about it. Right. They have no plan for a massive search effort. So starting on day two, the, the weather is moderate. This is Sunday, June 15th. Now we're going to start seeing resources and people coming into the area to assist in this search. On this day, we have nine Jeeps and we have three trucks that are used to transport searchers. They search trails. The trail search continues. And the initial searches of drainages begin. All hikers and campers spotted in the area are questioned. A large helicopter was acquired and was used to haul equipment for a base camp at Spence Field. The number of search personnel on day two was 240 people. Yeah. Now, we do have to note that there were poor conditions on that day and there was also inadequate food and water for the personnel involved yeah nothing pisses me off more when i go out into the woods searching for a missing six-year-old to see that crafts and service just really screwed up the spread well there's no sign of dennis at the end of day two okay mm -hmm. and more importantly 
there's no, um, actually I should say more strangely, there's no sign of him. There's no clues as to what could have happened to him. And one, and the other difficult thing here is you mentioned the rain and that affects things, but having 200 and some searchers that affects other things too, because at that point you can't bring in like a specialist or a tracker to mm. just track the single movements of this six year old boy. You already screwed up the scene by bringing in that many people. And sometimes you'll see in cases uh, of especially a younger child that they bring in a tracker before they bring in search units. Right. And that's interesting that you say that because you're exactly right. You would have, what did we say, 240 people just kind of uh, destroying the scene. Right. Right. Stomping all over the area. On day three, Monday, June 16th, the trail and drainage searches continued and an intensive grid search of Spence Field was conducted. Several military helicopters arrived to assist. The news media arrives on the scene and we have 40 special forces troops arrived to help as well. Two bloodhounds are brought in and they are used during day three. Right. Again, probably would be more helpful on day one or two because you have now 200 and some sense that are getting in the way of this dog's work. Yeah. After all that rain as well. And then we have the red cross that establishes a food service operation for searchers at Cades Cove. Now the total number of people involved in day three was 300, including personnel from the park, a local rescue squad, the air national guard. And as we said, 40 special forces troops. That brings us to day four, captain June 17th. Now, this is an interesting day because at this point we've had no sign of the little boy. However, at 2.30 in the afternoon, a set of one shoe on and one shoe off prints are found at this time. Mm. So the shoe print was possibly of an Oxford type shoe, what Dennis was last seen wearing. Now they followed for 300 feet until they came to the edge of a branch that feeds Eagle Creek in North Carolina. Eagle Creek feeds Montana Lake 10 miles from Spencer field. Mm. Even after three inches of rain having fell, these tracks were still intact in the mud. Investigators did not examine the shoe print finding in detail because the area had already been searched. The footprints could have been, overlooked by previous searchers because it was mentioned repeatedly that there were no footprints yeah. all over from searchers. The person who found the print used a stick to measure its size in comparison to an adult print. It is noted that there were no small children involved in the search at the time. So what does this mean? This well, that means we need to teach you how to say measure. Well, what this does mean is that they concluded that it's a child's footprint right that it's and a small footprint one shoe is on and one shoe is off correct and there are no children involved in the search the weird thing though like we just said is they did not investigate this finding because the area had already been searched and they found no prints they believed that they found no prints when they originally searched this area yeah that's strange seems like a misstep there 100%. And the scary thing for me in this is you say the tracks are leading towards a river. They're leading towards water, yes. Yeah, and then I'd want to know how deep that water was. And because if Dennis tried to cross this water, Dennis could have drowned in the water. Well, what we have here, Captain, is we have several creeks that are flowing into this Fontana Lake mm. or Fontana Lake. So this lake is huge. It, this is not a small body of water. This is a very large lake. So if, if we have this heavy rainfall that occurs, now we have these sweeping creeks and streams that have strong currents that are leading to this large body of water. If he were to have slipped, fell, mudslide, any reason to end up in one of those creeks or streams, he very likely could have ended up in the lake itself. Well, and we have footprints going in, so we have evidence of possibly him going into the water but we don't have any evidence of him leaving the water. And Correct. Then, and so not only do you have to search the other side, but you need to figure out how fast this water is moving. And if he did get into the water and did get pushed around a little bit, would he drift down the water a little bit and come out 
on the other side, if he if he could come out on the other side, the tracks would be somewhere else. Well, keep in mind too, we're finding these prints on day four. Yeah. The the speed of that creek or stream would have been significantly greater the night that he went missing with two and a half inches of rain falling that night. Yeah, I would argue though to find these tracks, this is probably happening after it rains mm-hmm. because the because they would be deeper so they wouldn't wash away. And it would also have to be after some of the rain where maybe there is a little bit of rain, but you're talking about a six-year-old. So these are not going to be very deep footprints. Right. I get what you're saying. He only weighed about 55 pounds is mm. what is believed. So, yeah, he's not a big giant man who's leaving huge footprints in the mud or dirt. Now, I did find some notes from a meeting that was held on Wednesday, June 18th. Mm -hmm. This was the quote-unquote first strategy meeting. And I found notes from several people involved in that meeting, but I just wanted to go through some of the notes from the chief ranger. So we all have a good understanding of the search itself, the problems that they ran into. Mm -hmm. And his his notes say, uh, first, unable to transport men. The roads are in bad shape due to heavy rainfall. That they needed more helicopters. The helicopters actually nullified the need for a huge base camp at Spence Field, which they did spend time setting up that huge base camp. Right. Waste of time. He also noted that the helicopters were using jet fuel, so they were losing search time by flying to the base for to refuel these helicopters from time mm-hmm. to time. He also stated that they should be reaching out to North Carolina because at some point there's going to have to be a cutoff Uh, for the search that's being conducted on the Tennessee side. And if you've covered all your ground on that side, he may be on the North Carolina side Mm -hmm. and you need to search there. He also said that um, here was one thing that was, was uh, didn't make you feel very good. Okay. He said, we need a reference map to show areas that have been covered each day and daily so we can record areas covered in the effort made meaning they they weren't operating with one big map that they're all looking at and saying look on this day we searched here right from this time to this time nothing found on this day we searched here so forth and so on so while we have people at the top trying to organize this search it's also kind of loosey-goosey it seems like you have a lot of people coming into the area trying to help but we don't have a lot of cohesiveness to this actual search look this this happened in 1969 i think because of the lack of technology the lack of experience with putting together search teams the lack of being able to communicate easily with one another that i believe dennis would have been found within a day or two if it happened you know this coming weekend he also makes a note that fbi agent jim reich was checking the martin family's background for any possibilities if they were involved in this disappearance of their son or grandson or whomever. Now, the other thing too, and this is disconcerting is that we have on day five, he makes a note to tell select leaders to watch for circling buzzards and note any strange odors. Support for today's show comes from Brooke Lennon. Named the winner of the best online betting category by Good Housekeeping, Brooke Lennon is the fastest growing betting brand in the world with over 20,000 five star reviews. Brooke Lennon's mission is simple to bring five star hotel quality sheets to everyday life, offering luxury sheets without luxury markup. And their method? They eliminate the middleman to keep things personal, from design to manufacturing to customer service and beyond. I sleep on Brooklyn and sheets because they are the most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. I've also given them as gifts to other people. That's how much I enjoy them. And guess what? I was on their website the other day, brooklinen.com, shopping for another set of sheets. They got so many styles to choose from. You have to check out their website. My Brooklinen sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Brooklinen.com is giving an exclusive offer to my listeners. Get $25 off and free shipping when you use promo code garage at brooklinen.com. 
Brooklyn and is so sure that you're going to love your new sheets that they offer a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guaranteed and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use promo code GARAGE at brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen.com. B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code GARAGE. Brooklinen. These really are the best sheets ever. As your family is getting back into the swing of school schedules, let HelloFresh take the guesswork out of meals week after week. Even amidst the after-school chaos, HelloFresh's meal kits make it easy to decide what you're going to do for dinner, and you can have family meals ready in just 30 minutes. Not to mention, with easy-to-follow recipes and pre-measured ingredients, HelloFresh comes in handy on those hectic school nights when your to-do list is a mile long and you're busy chauffeuring the kids to school practices and study groups. Plus, you can get two meals out of one with HelloFresh leftovers as school and work lunches the next day. There's even a one-pot recipe on the menu every week for those busy weeknights when maximum flavor with minimal cleanup is ideal. You and I both love HelloFresh. Mm-hmm. It's no secret, right? We've been, we've been doing the HelloFresh thing for a couple years now. Last night, I made fantastic smothered chicken enchiladas. Mmm, tasty treats. It's so convenient, so helpful, and I'm an Iron Chef in the kitchen. For a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com slash Garage60 and enter code Garage60. That's like receiving six meals free when you go to HelloFresh.com slash garage 60 and enter code garage 60 that's hellofresh.com garage 60 all right cheers mates cheers to you captain let's get back to the case of dennis martin well, I want to discuss um, a couple plans that were set up, and this was set up by the chief ranger, and these were discussed in some of these strategy meetings. So the chief ranger set up two plans. Let's say plan A, plan B. Plan A is what do we do if we find the boy alive? Plan B, what do we do if we find the boy dead? So under plan A, the boy would be taken by helicopter to the Knoxville headquarters of the U.S. Marine Reserves, and then by ambulance to the University of Tennessee Hospital. Under Plan B, the Blunt County Coroner would be notified. And this is what they had to tell the searchers, because this is a large area. So you may have one individual that's kind of out on their own find the boy either alive or deceased. So we better have a plan organized to relay this information to other people, especially if he's alive so we can get him help as soon as possible. Yeah. But I, I also think the plan, if you find the boy dead, it almost feels like they had a hunch that maybe something went wrong. Somebody in the family possibly was responsible. Well, we have the FBI that was checking the backgrounds of the Martin family. So the instructions to finders, uh, One is if you find him, first determine, obviously, if dead or alive. Then notify the chief ranger by the fastest means available and give location and detail. If dead, the radio code is 10200. If alive, radio code is 10100A. So if you find him, climb a tree, set a flag, Mm -hmm. also build a fire. If you are one of the military personnel, use a smoke bomb or some other form of signal for a helicopter. Then stand by while special forces repel in by helicopter and secure the boy if alive, or if dead, guard the area until released by the chief ranger or the coroner. So guard the area because we're going to want to look that area over. We're going to want to see clues. We're going to see what we can find to tell us what happened to this boy if we find him dead. Yeah, now all the reports that you read, and there's been obviously so many years have passed since this, uh, since Dennis went missing. Have you found anything that would lead you to any suspicion on the father? No, 100% no. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, and this is, you know, we talked about this very briefly last week, and 
really all I had to offer when we talked about it was I was like, this is just a, this is a sad story and I can't find anything to suggest that the family knew anything other than what they told the Rangers knew anything other than what they told the police and the FBI and the searchers Mm -hmm. actually, in all honesty, man, I kind of think that the Martin family, the father and the grandfather might've been searching more for this kid than anybody else. Right. And you know, and I, I know that we, we cover a lot of cases and we often say, you got to look for the family. You got to look toward the family. Mm-hmm. Their whereabouts are fairly known. I mean, there it's, it's pretty pinpointed out to us where they were, what they were doing at the time. We have a brief moment. You know, we have a short period of time where the father is off on his own searching the grandfather is off on his own searching. But the thing I want to point out here is we have a whole other family of people that was there at the time of the disappearance, at the time that it was noticed that this boy went missing. Yeah, and where that gets confusing is their last name is Martin, but they're not any relation. I'm glad you cleared that up because I couldn't figure that out 100%. At first, I made the assumption that they were uh, related. Mm -hmm. And then I found... um, Dennis Martin's father's obituary. He passed away in 2014 and I found his obituary to try to check to see if Dr. Martin was on there as being in relation to him and he was not listed. So thank you for clearing that up because that's been a headache for me. But again, the, the important thing here is if, if the, his, if Dennis Martin's father had something to do with this or his grandfather had something to do with this, Mm -hmm. we have a whole other family of people that were there at the time that the boy went missing and they're not saying anything. They're not saying, Hey, the father was suspicious. Mm -hmm. Hey, the grandfather did. He was acting weird. We don't have any of that. And we have other children. We have other children that would have been eyewitnesses that could have told police or Rangers something was going on as well. Now we have a search, a massive search effort that goes on for over 16 days, Captain. And we're not going to go through every detail of that search because we'd be talking about it for 16 days. So in a quick breakdown of that search, just, just trust me when I say this was a massive search effort. Okay. Dennis is not found over the course of these 16 days. On one day at the peak, when we have the most searchers looking for the little boy, we have 1,400 people out there. And we talked about all the helicopters involved. We have special forces. I think it was recorded that 66, eventually 66 Green Berets were out there looking for this boy. Mm -hmm. These are people that are trained to go into areas like this and find someone, whether they are dead or alive. They are specifically trained for this. So when I say that they didn't find the boy, Here's the thing. When you have a search for a person, a lot of times people on the outside looking in, they're going to set the standard of, was it a successful search? How hard did they try based off of, did they find the person? Right. This situation, while they weren't prepared going into it, they adapted as they could along the way. They brought in a lot of people, a lot of resources. He wasn't found, but it wasn't because of lack of effort. There was a lot of effort to find this boy. Well, and it's not like he's just in a, you know, open field somewhere. We have very tight, packed in woods. Mm-hmm. I think then you have the other element of if he was attacked by an animal, that animal could have took his body somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he fell into a river or a lake or something like that, then you know, I don't know if they were searching those extensively Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm guessing they weren't but uh, you'd think they would search some of those they were searching the the drainages Um, Mm -hmm. in all honesty I thought when I looked through the detailed versions of the searches and the efforts made I saw a bit of a lack of effort on some of the larger bodies of water in the area I think they search portions of those, but not the entirety. Now, right. So that's those are some of the elements they have going against yeah, them. Yeah, uh, we do have rangers that stayed on and promised the Martin family that they would continue to look for their little boy as long as it took. Right. And basically, we have a meeting that takes place after 16 days of searching, where everybody in the meeting kind of has to throw up their hands and say. Well, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. What do we do now? And part of those people were the Martin family as well. The Martin family saying, 
what do we do? We, well, we've tried everything. Well, let's dive into there. There's only one account or a possible account of an eyewitness seeing Dennis. Yes. So here's the thing. If, if you believe this theory, then it's likely that Dennis was abducted. Yeah. And hold on. We're going <laughs> to. <laughs> I should preference this. This is going to get a, a little strange. Right, but. and I'm not laughing at the thought of the boy being abducted. I'm laughing yeah. at the thought of things that have been discussed because of this possible eyewitness account. Well, you might be laughing about that because you don't laugh at any of my jokes. Well, so on the afternoon that Dennis disappeared, we have Harold Key. He's 45 years old. He's from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. He was near the Rowan's I hope I said that right, but we're going to go with that. Rowan's Creek, which is a short distance away from the Martin family's campground. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Harold Key and his family had been walking a trail in the area looking for wildlife, in particular, any signs of black bears nearby when they heard an enormous sickening scream. A guttural growl. Okay. So within moments. Well, look, I think that's important. Yes. Yeah. Key's son pointed out a bear quote unquote, a bear nearby. Now, how old was the son? Do is that in the report? Uh, Cause I, I couldn't find that. I couldn't either. And this is actually a very weird eyewitness account. The whole thing about it's weird. Mm -hmm. Um, the bear was located up by the Ridge. This is a bit of a ways from them. Now, Mr. Key, upon observing the quote unquote bear, his son had spotted determined that this was not a bear, uh, but rather what he would refer to as a dark figured, rough, looking man mm -hmm. attempting Disheveled. to well he says that he thinks that this individual was trying to hide behind some of the bush there mm -hmm. and the man which key didn't manage to view in clear detail had purportedly been carrying something over his shoulder harold key unaware of dennis martin's disappearance earlier that afternoon supposed that the figure might have been a moonshiner who had you know, was trying to hide from them. Mm -hmm. And upon learning days later, there's the key there days later of the search for Dennis Martin, Harold key notified the FBI about what he and his family had seen the same afternoon. Dennis went missing. The FBI gets involved, right? So they actually rule this out as uh, they rule it as being not connected to Dennis Martin's disappearance because this was about nine miles away from where the boy was last seen. Mm -hmm. And the FBI's thought here is that at the approximate time that Mr. Key and his son see this unkept man is what the, the theory is actually called and referred to as a lot, the unkept man theory. At the time that they believed that they saw this individual, it would have been too far of a distance away for the small child to have uh, made his way there or to have been... Uh, carried by this man. Mm, yeah. Okay. So shall we dive into this? Just, just rip right through it. Or should we get into some other stuff, captain? Cause there's a lot of weird things here. Well, I think the weird thing is that we have a kid. We, and again, we don't know the age saying I saw a bear. And I believe after his father says, no, it was a disheveled man. His son still says, no, nah, it was a bear. Mm-hmm. And that, and that's where we have, uh, the, this is where it gets a little strange because normally your father says, no, it was a disheveled man. And the kid would go, okay, maybe it was mm -hmm. in this case, from what the reports I've read, the kid says, no, it was a bear or at least something with fur. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, uh, the coast to coast talk starts. And, and when people start saying, well, we have this this guttural growl, this almost scream, which when you hear that initially, they're looking for a six-year-old boy. Oh, it's the six-year-old boy. He's the one screaming. No, it's this disheveled man that's screaming, mm -hmm. possibly. Now, again, if he's some uh, moonshiner and he's hiding in the bushes from you or hiding behind trees from you, why would he let out a guttural scream? Mm-hmm. So that's when people start putting on their Velcro shoes and going out into the woods and looking for the Bigfoot. 
The Sasquatch. The thought being that a rogue Sasquatch mm-hmm. abducted Dennis Miller. Well, or no, Miller, no, well, Dennis Martin, I'm sorry. Well, let's start with the first idea of this. Is that they hear this guttural growl. They see this disheveled man or bear. And it's, and it's neither one of those. It's a combination. It's a Bigfoot. Has something on his shoulder. We don't know if that's Dennis or not. So it could just be a weird sighting has nothing to do with the disappearance. People go a little step further and say, okay, well, if this Bigfoot is carrying something and that something that he's carrying again, we have, we know that Dennis was wearing a red shirt. I don't think there's anywhere that they report that the key family saw, you know, this figure carrying something that had a red shirt or red anything according to mr key he could not identify what this thing or person was carrying right or or if he was in fact carrying something at all right and what i'd argue is if he was carrying this child that had a red shirt on and that doesn't mean that the shirt couldn't have left him at some point but Mm -hmm. i'm saying if the kid still had the red shirt on dead or alive you would have been able to see that red shirt from Mm -hmm. the distance that they saw you might not be able to make it out exactly what you saw, but you'd go, well, he was carrying something on his shoulder, and it was red. Mm-hmm. And that would lead me to believe that whatever they saw had something to do with the disappearance. Um, But I don't know. Look, here's the thing. It was not a Bigfoot. It was not a Sasquatch, Yeti, whatever you want to call him. It was not that. Why is that? Or our you, thought of that. Now, I don't believe in. No, I'll Bigfoot. get in. I'll get into it and I'll break it down real quick for you. But before I do, I would love if something like that existed. The world would be a <laughs> lot more interesting if something like that existed. The whole reason I got into true crime when I was a little kid was because I to was find reading Bigfoot. No, I was reading oh. about Bigfoot and and sea monsters and stuff like that. And I got a little older and I was like, well, this is not likely. There's not a whole lot of substance here. Let's read about some other form of mystery, and that began my love of true crime. That was my favorite um, parts of Unsolved Mysteries, when they would dive into Bigfoot sightings and Loch Ness Monsters, because it, mm-hmm. it seemed like it kind of, you know, the the disappearance or the possible murder cases that when they do- dove into different things like that or alien uh, abductions, it kind of lighten the mood a little bit well here's why that's not possible okay let's say the easiest way for me to explain this is that there are a lot of varied reports of this possible eyewitness account and what i mean by that is there was one original true statement that was given at the Mm get-go and since then there have been more fanciful versions of this same story where people are taking it, they're recounting the story and they are giving it their own version. They're spinning it a little bit. And some of the versions that I've seen, captain, Mm -hmm. there's dozens of them out there. And some of them are downright. They sound like a science fiction story rather than the actual account. Right. So if you want to break down the actual account, there there's some that even refer to this individual that, that say that Harold key says he saw an ape man. He never said he saw an ape man. Right. He said he saw a dark complected, unkept man, hairy man. Mm. Okay. He said that he saw someone that appeared to be, that didn't want to be spotted by anybody. He also said that this individual, when, whenever they threw this thing over their shoulder, whatever they were carrying, they threw something over their shoulder, walked away. And Harold key believes that the individual got into a white vehicle and drove off. Okay, so here's some problems with that. Unless Sasquatch owns a white vehicle, Mm -hmm. then it's not Sasquatch that Harold Key saw. So you're saying Bigfoot doesn't know how to drive a car. That's what you're saying. If he does, Mm. then he must have done quite the shave and haircut before he showed up to get his license, his driver's license picture taken. Look, I'm not saying that you're not an expert on Bigfoot, but what I am saying is... I've seen Harry in the Henderson at least a hundred times, and I believe he drives a car. <laughs> well, so I, no, I get what you're saying, but but I'm regardless if, uh, and I'm not here to argue cryptozoology with anybody. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just I'm just stating the facts are that 
Harold Key never said or referred to this individual as an ape man, number one. And number two, whatever he said that he saw, he believes that that thing, that person got into a white vehicle and drove away. Mm -hmm. Now, again, uh, there there was an animal a long time ago called Giganopithecus. I believe that's how you say it, which was a giant ape figure that that believe they believe walked on two legs so that there would be some sign that something like a big foot foot existed at some point now we've had a million sightings but now with technology everybody has a camera everybody has a video camera in their phone um i have seen a couple videos that i can't watch and explain to you what i'm seeing and again, I'm with you. I'd love if these existed. Where it gets hairy, pardon the pun, is this figure gets into a car. And if there's any truth to that statement, then what he saw was probably a disheveled man. And then these reports of his son saying, no, it's a bear. That might not be accurate. And then, but what happens in this case you got this missing boy, six years old. Then it goes from Bigfoot sightings to possible alien alien abductions and this theory that these aliens, um, when they come down to Earth, that they have bases with inside rivers and lakes and these deep forest areas and that maybe he was abducted by an alien. Then you have other reports that maybe there's portals and I don't want... Uh, I'll put this out there. I haven't read the missing 411. I saw the docu- documentary. I've heard that the book goes more into the unexplained as far as portals, time traveling portals, alien portals. Um, again, I, look, I don't know where the evidence is. You know, like I said, I've seen a couple videos of of Bigfoot and a couple videos of alien and ufo sightings that i can't explain that doesn't mean that they're real so uh i hope some of this stuff exists somewhere but i don't think it has any bearing on this case at all even though for whatever reason it gets brought up a lot well i think the this eyewitness account what what i think you're missing here what i think everyone seems to be missing for some reason is what this man says, Harold Key says that whoever I saw there in the woods, whether he was carrying something or not, got into a vehicle and drove off. Well, so, I didn't miss that. No, I but no, but you you went way out on left field here with with some alien talk, and I know that there's been a lot of it. But no, what no, no, that's not my talk. What I'm saying is because of the Bigfoot sightings, that has led to other people that have some fascination with true crime, but mainly their fascination is in alien sightings and Bigfoot sightings and time traveling portals and all that stuff. And that stuff, look, I love coast to coast. I love listening to um, some odd stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is this case, people took this sighting of a disheveled man, turned that into Bigfoot, turned that into aliens, turned that into time traveling portals. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. You know, it, I believe this case is pretty simple. You have a six year old boy that went out to hide and maybe went too far. And then as he got turned around, started going, okay, I need to pop out in the woods. I need to go this way. And you said that, you know, one of the key things that you said is there was a time lapse of maybe 10 minutes. Maybe there was a time lapse of 10 minutes. Again, in every case, you can go five minutes forwards or five minutes backwards. And if you go backwards, now you got 15 minute time window that that boy was missing. Maybe, maybe even as much as a 20 minute time window. And if that kid got turned around and thought, and this has happened. Look, um, when I was in boy Scouts would go out and play, you know, hide and go seek and stuff like that. I remember one time getting so freaking confused because we were playing up on a hill. And then I, then I took off running went down the hill to hide, and then I ended up going up a hill and getting turned around for a second and started going the wrong way. 
and I then saw some of my buddies like way over, and I was thought, oh crap, I'm I'm way in the wrong area. So is it possible? Is it very possible that a six year old boy goes out there to hide, gets turned around, and starts? I'm just going to head in this direction, and depending on how fast he's heading in that direction, now you're half a mile away. Now you're uh, a mile away, right? And and you could be a mile away in in 15 minutes. Uh, then even if he's not moving quickly, but he's moving in a direction that you're not searching, now you're talking within an hour. He's three or four miles away, and and you know in in two three hours now now he's he's at that point almost he is a lifetime away. That's probably why they never found him. Well, the key thing that I want to point out here regarding the story of Harold Key and his son and that possible eyewitness sighting is the vehicle. Because we have a statement that says the FBI ruled this out as being connected as it was nine miles from Spence Field. It was too far. Well, it's not too far if somebody took the boy from Spence Field, put him in a vehicle, and drove the nine miles and ended up there for some reason. Okay. It's That's not true. It's yeah. not too far for that. So why they chose to ru- rule this out makes absolutely zero sense to me because if this person was the perpetrator of some kind of crime, of some kind of abduction, he had access to a vehicle and likely used it. Yeah, no, and, and where they went, Spence Field, where they were at, you said had two shelters. Mm-hmm. There was campgrounds. But we also have two families that are pretty close together. You would think that if this individual saw an opportunity to grab a six-year-old, that there would be some kind of eyewitness, either of the man at Spence Field or some kind of eyewitness of his vehicle Mm -hmm. there. So, I mean, that's the only reason why it seems unlikely to me. But we're not talking about a situation where the Martin family and the other Martin family are the only people in the area camping or staying. No, I understand that. We're talking about a very busy area with lots of people coming in from all areas to stay there and spend the weekend. No, and I understand that as well. Again, now you have more people, more possible eyewitnesses that didn't see a man carrying a child. Um, this child, again, we don't. I don't know for sure, but with this child scream, yell, whatever. And also we have more eyewitnesses that didn't see this vehicle. And you think, but we don't have a great description of the vehicle. It's not like we have, have a situation where they're saying, I saw a white Buick 1986 with a maroon vinyl top. No, this guy's saying, I think that the guy got into a white vehicle and drove off. That's, that's as good of a description as you get a vehicle that could have been white. And then we have a, we also have a situation of if this man as described the one that's hiding in the woods, Bigfoot. Well, if he is as described, you would think he would be easily remembered. He would be memorable to the people staying in the area, the quote unquote unkept man. The problem is I wonder the amount of distance between this individual and the key family, as well as the obstacles between them. I don't think that they had a very good. I don't think they got a very good sight of this individual. I not, mean, not when somebody's saying it's a this it's an gentleman. animal, yeah, a bear. And somebody's saying no, it's a bear. I mean, you could no. you could have a guy wearing a brown sweater at a great distance, and he's got some weird hat on, and maybe that's where you come up with this strange description of this individual. Well, and I I think the thing that is it possible that there's this pedophile out there. Or, or a murderer, a child murderer that's out there just trying to find a victim. That's very possible. I mean, we've seen times with uh, Bundy and other people that go to campgrounds and, and to kind of stock prey. It's possible. The But you always have to look at the evidence, and I think one of the pieces of evidence is when they found the shoe print, mm-hmm. where there's one shoe print and then the missing shoe mm-hmm. print. You're finding that, uh, I don't know how far away it was from the site uh, that he went missing, but I think it was 
a distance. And so again, it's like the, the eyewitness of the disheveled man would have to line up with the boy going missing at this time. And then when the, the shoe prints were found, and I think the shoe prints would have been found after that. Mm-hmm. And if I'm correct on that, then I think this disheveled man probably has nothing to do with the case. I think if the shoe prints um, were there and if they are, in fact, part of the disappearance, if they were left there by Dennis Martin, mm-hmm. I think they probably should have been found on day two of the search. I don't see any way that the family and some people helping and assisting and three rangers would have found those prints during the course of two and a half inches of rainfall. Right. So day two. Now we do know we have to believe I don't have record of where those prints were found, but the inference we can make is that they should have been somewhat close to where the Martin family was staying because the key word, the words that are used is stating that this area had already been searched and these prints weren't there or not believed to have been there the first time we searched this. We know that when they first started searching, they started searching in the most likely areas first and worked their way out. That means starting close by where the Martin family was staying. Well, and that's the other scary thing too, though, is, I mean, you, you said it, I believe, uh, in the trailer, um, that it took them an hour once, not an hour, took them a day one time to find a missing plane. It was a year, a whole, a whole year. Wow. I, I need to pay attention to you, you more. You, you were only off by 364 days. Hey, that's not, hey. but I want to keep it. I, I think we should keep in mind, you know, I've gone over that statement time and time again. And I'm like, well, of course they didn't find Den, Dennis Martin. How would you, if it took you a year to find a plane, mm-hmm. but the plane got there in a much different way than Dennis would get to where he may be resting. Right. right. But what I mean by that is, is it possible that they're searching for this child, but because he's so small and because the woods are so dense that you can't see him maybe 15 yards away. So he walks by you during the search. And so is it possible that again, these footprints are not left till day two or possibly even day three. And then you go, he's here. He's been here the whole time. We're just not seeing him when we're searching. I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't know the terrain too well. I mean, I've seen a few pictures, but it seems like once you got into those woods that it'd be hard to spot anything. So here's my, one of my thoughts. And you know, it's tough for me to go a whole case without throwing somebody under the bus or at least bringing up some good questions that I think have not been looked at regarding individuals. And my first question would be for Mr. Harold key, the one that has this quote unquote possible eyewitness statement, right? Mm -hmm. He does not report this for days because he didn't, he was unaware that there was a missing person for days. I wonder where was Harold key during the course of those days before he reported this. And what I'm getting at is, (laughs) Okay. Well, well, I don't think that should be laughed at. We've caught, we've covered so many cases where somebody comes forward with a possible eyewitness account. Why do they do that? Sometimes they're trying to create and establish an alibi for themselves. They were actually up to no good. Yeah. But isn't his wife with him? Well, that's no, that's what I mean. I would like to know where this individual was during the course of those days. Mm -hmm. And how does it turn into that? He doesn't know that there's somebody missing four days when we have statements all along the way that searchers, when they came across anybody else, they'd be like, Hey, we're looking for a six year old boy. His name's Dennis. He was wearing this. Have you seen anybody? Mm -hmm. And so he's like, well, I saw a disheveled man. But what I mean, Captain, is, is when this sighting occurred, did the Keys shortly leave after that? And they didn't become aware of Dennis Martin missing until they saw it on the news when they returned to their home. Right. And they're sitting at home in, in the comfort of their family room, and they see it on the news. So that's just one question I have. I don't, I'm not trying to <laughs> to make it look like anybody's guilty of anything. Right. What? But what I'm getting at is we have a very possibly – important eyewitness account that we have no information of. Mm -hmm. We're fed this account so many times. And if you look into this case, like I said, you'll find two dozen different versions of this account. Yeah. And only one of them is correct. 
yet we have no follow-up information on Mr. Key, his family, what they were doing, why they were in the area, and and where were they and to whom did they finally report this possible sighting of this man and or this boy? Well, let's get into the other weird story involving this disappearance of Dennis Martin. It's not as weird as Bigfoots or aliens, but it's still odd. So several years after Dennis went missing, an illegal ginseng hunter claims that he had found a skull and other remains of a small boy, or I'm guessing, I don't know how you would determine it was a boy or a girl, but state that in the same vicinity. However, this person did not report this to anybody officially until 1985 because the man had feared that he might be arrested for his illegal activity in the area, which led him to the discovery. Mm -hmm. This area was around three miles away from where Dennis was last seen. And then a later search of this area yielded no results. So many years after the incident. Yeah. And for whatever reason, my gut just tells me that this story isn't true, that this guy didn't see a skull or anything. I believe that after he told them, even though so much time passed, I, I believe they would have found something, right. some kind of remains. This is a lie. This has got to be a lie. I mean, anybody that, that would come forward to want to do the right thing, we, what are you going to do, Captain? You mm-hmm. and I have talked about this. You get rid of your damn ginseng and you go report your findings immediately. Well, you said it was 1984 when he came out. When, when he finally reported this incident, it was 1985. Okay, so 16 years after the boy goes missing. I mean, so if, if you are telling the truth, you're a horrible piece of shit because you waited for 16 years. And if you're not telling the truth, you're a horrible piece of shit because you're lying about it. Well, and so also either way, keep in mind that, real piece of shit. that when the search was finally, you know, when it was over, they had searched 56 square miles of land, 56 mm-hmm. square miles of land. This guy says that he found this uh, around three miles away from where Dennis was last seen. And here's the other thing that's strange about his statement. I found a skull and other remains of a small boy in this area. Again, years later, after years of decomposition, how would this guy know that it was a small boy? Right. You know, what indicators told him it was a small boy and not a small girl? Right. And then the indicators are that he read this story somewhere and he wanted to be a part of it. Right. That to me, you should probably look into individuals like that, though. You know what I mean? Because it's like, why? Why does this guy want to be a part of the story again? And, but it also shows that there's also people up there hunting when they shouldn't be. And so, again, does Dennis go into the woods and get, does he get lost? Does he get attacked by an animal or does he, does he find some evil piece of shit out there? I have trouble with the theory of an animal attack as well. And the reason being is I think there would have been evidence of such. I think that we would have found something of Dennis or some, something belonging to Dennis after this animal attack. Mm -hmm. This, that never happened. There's no sign of this boy anywhere. Well I, oh well, I think it's in the documentary Missing 411, or at least in a documentary that I watched recently where the same scenario, they they went up somewhere, the boy, these kids were playing, they turned around, the boy was, uh, they were hiking on a trail. Mm-hmm. They turn around, the boy is gone. And so then they hightail it back to where the father was staying and say, hey, we can't find your boy. He goes up there, or maybe it was the grandfather. They go up and start looking. They can't find anything. Mm-hmm. And one of the rangers would tell you this. If an animal would attack anything, it is going to take those remains with it. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, you would argue, would you find blood? Well, you're talking about he goes missing. We don't have anybody with any knowledge searching until 830. So now it's dark. Then once it starts raining, would whatever blood would have been found at the scene where he was attacked, mm-hmm. would that be washed away? Mm-hmm. And so my gut feeling is, to me, it's this simple. I think he got turned around. He got lost. He either was attacked, you know, got lost and moved around for a while and then got attacked by an animal mm-hmm. or 
he, you know, was lost roaming around and possibly tried to, you know, oh, if I just cross this water and, you know, uh, drown in the water. I think those, to me, are the two most likely scenarios. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we have a situation where I would say the most probable is that somehow the boy got disoriented, he got lost, and for whatever reason, ended up in water. Now, that could be a million different reasons as to why. Wh- maybe he put himself in water. But we all, And we also have some evidence of this. We do have footprints that lead towards water. And we, he, the boy's got no food or water, no food or drink. So did he go towards water to, to drink something at some mm-hmm. point? The, the only thing that I have issue with in this theory is that, okay, so the average adult would walk a mile in about a little less than 20 minutes. A six-year-old boy, okay, let's go ahead and expand that out to about 30 minutes. And you also have to factor in it's rough terrain. He's not walking on a paved road, on a flat paved road. This is the wilderness where this child is walking. His father and grandfather began looking for him, if we're to believe the stories, within minutes within a very short period of time, calling out his name. Why did he not return their shouts? Why didn't he shout back at them? Why? Mm -hmm. And if he did, why didn't they hear him? He would have been close enough in that time period that they should have heard him. So it's, it's a very troubling thing because what seems the most probable of him getting lost and then ending up in the water. And if he were anywhere, if he were any, anywhere, on that property to this day, it would be in the water because that's where they had the toughest time searching. That's where they weren't able to conduct proper searches shortly after he went missing. But again, the troubling thing is why didn't he call back to his dad and his grandfather? And if he did, why didn't they hear him? So then my other thought, my number two theory, number one would be he got lost and something happened to him. It's still surprising to me that all this time later, they've never found anything or, you know, to, to tell us what happened. But my number two theory would be that he was abducted. And what I mean by that is some people have said, really, all those people in that big of an area and he is abducted. That just seems like too perfect of a scenario for the abductor. You, you the thing that these people are having trouble figuring out is, I'm not suggesting a theory where Dennis Martin was targeted to be abducted. I'm pointing out a thought and theory of the abductor went to this location and thought, you know what? There's going to be a bunch of people here. Mm -hmm. There might be unsupervised children. I'm going to watch some of the children in the area. And if I see someone unattended to, if I see an opportunity, I'm taking it. And We have a situation here where if we have an abductor who's attracted to young boys, well, he very well may have been watching those four young boys playing together that day Mm -hmm. and thought, you know what? I might like to take one of those boys. And a situation may have presented itself where three boys went off in one direction and poor little Dennis went off in another direction. And either he was enticed by this individual to walk further into the woods or he was grabbed up by this individual. And you pointed out a very good thing. You pointed out a very smart observation, Captain. And that's one that I'm having trouble getting over. And this is why the abduction theory is my second most probable to me, is that if he was abducted, there would have had to have been some time of this individual running with the boy in his arms. And nobody ever saw that. Nobody ever came forward saying, you know, if somebody would have come forward, Believe you me, this would be an abduction. This would not be a missing person's case. This would be an abduction case. Mm -hmm. And they would have investigated as such right from the get-go. And so that's a a smart, intelligent observation that you've made. And so those are my thoughts. And 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 I apologize that I can't have a better answer for you. But those seem to be the most likely. And here, here's the thing, as far as the abduction goes, Captain, this is why I can't get over the thought that it might have been an abduction. There's no trace of this boy anywhere. It's almost as whatever happened to him not only removed Dennis, but it removed everything 
that Dennis had on his person at that time. Mm -hmm. It removed all trace of Dennis at that time from the area. I believe we have a search here that was big enough that if he was in the area, he would have been found or something of him could have been found. What's scary here is, you know, you just look up missing persons from parks numbers as far as over 1600 people going missing. This is a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I think it, it shows one that, that um, mother nature and the wilderness is not anything that you should take lightly. Right. You could just get lost. You could be attacked by an animal. You could, again, you could have an accident falling off a cliff, something with water. So, uh, you know, be careful out there. And, and I think the reason why some of these crazy, you know, quote unquote, crazy ideas as far as alien abduction and time travel portals and dimension portals and Bigfoot sightings and, and possible other animals is because there is so many individuals that have gone missing that we don't have answers to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's people trying to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And I do want to address two other things that have been pointed out in this case as being quote unquote weird. Okay. The first being author Dwight McCarter. Uh, he's the author of lost a ranger's journal of search and rescue he had a strange tale to tell about the Martin case in which McCarter in which McCarter claimed that during the search for Dennis Martin, the special forces units that had been called in had barely communicated at all with authorities, rangers, or civilian searchers, instead working on their own as if, in his words, they had their own agenda. He also states that they had been heavily armed as if they were expecting something big to happen. And he asked, what could this mean? I want to address that real quick here, Captain. I think this, this is another way of making this story more fanciful than it is, than what it actually is. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the Green Berets. When they came in to look for the boy, they were going to work on their own. Okay, these are, this is a unit, a special forces unit that is trained, highly trained to conduct searches and find people and remove them from an area. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're not going to fraternize with the local rangers, with some locals that helped search that are only going to muddy the waters for them, cloud their operation. They're not going to spend time communicating with those individuals. They can do nothing but slow them down. Well, this is another reason why the Bigfoot community has said that Bigfoot was involved. And this is evidence of that because when they came in that they knew that they're looking for a boy and it's possibly that he was abducted by a Bigfoot. That's, that's what I've read time and time again. And the other thought of what could this mean that they were heavily armed? Um, they're the green berets. How would you expect them to be armed? Mm -hmm. They're going to be armed the way that they're always going to be armed on any search and rescue mission. Let me tell you something. When they sit down at dinner table, they're heavily armed. The other weird, weird detail that people bring up is that the lead FBI investigator on the case, Agent Jim Reich, later committed suicide. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but people in law enforcement have a higher rate of suicide than most other professions. It's just a fact, okay? We're talking about, they want to paint this picture of, well, Jim Reich must have known something that the general right. public didn't, and he couldn't take it anymore, so he killed himself. Did he know things that the general public didn't know? Of course. He's in the FBI. Right. But most likely it was about other cases. This guy was probably, he worked a stressful job for many years. And who knows what other stressors it added to his life, his personal life and his family life. I'm sorry, but to point out that the agent that worked this case later committed suicide, it, it has no bearing on this case itself. It means right. nothing. It carries no weight. So again, Captain, we have a lot of strange theories out there that are interesting to read and think about, but they just don't carry any weight. Yeah, I don't want any hate from the Bigfoot community. I don't want any hate from aliens or, or ghosts or any community or time travel or portals of different dimensions. I'm into it all. Mm -hmm. I, I watch some of the craziest things you've ever seen, and then sometimes I laugh afterwards, and sometimes I go, that shit might be real. You know, it all depends on the day. I right. think, but I do find that stuff 
fascinating. I enjoy it. I mean, I've been a big fan of Coast to Coast for years, and I, I, I find those, they're just puzzles, and they're, they're like mind puzzles, and I think that it's fun to think about. And I do want to point out a couple of things here too, Captain. We have the Martin family, okay? Everything that I read states that the grandfather, Dennis Martin's grandfather, was looking for the child till very late in his life. We also have his father, William Martin. William Martin, you know one test that he passed that the Martin family passed for me was they didn't move away. Mm -hmm. he, he lived in the same home that he lived in with Dennis at the time of Dennis's disappearance till very late in life. And he was married to Dennis's mother for 55 years until he passed away in 2014. And again, everything I read stated that he was looking for his son until he passed away. All right. I hope everybody had a great Labor Day weekend. Hope it was fun. Hope you got some nice cold drinks. And enjoy the short work week. That's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the best part of uh, you get the great holiday followed by the short work week. A little recommended reading for everybody out there. Uh, this week we were recommending Missing, When the Sun Sets, the Jared Adadero story, and Sun is spelled S-O-N. Discover the case that rocked the state of Colorado for five years and changed the way many view their world forever. On October 2nd, 1999, three-year-old Jared Adadero vanished on a group hike in the Comanche Peak Wilderness. As hours turned into days and days into months, Jared's father, Alan, goes through hell and high water to combat nightmarish circumstances hindering the search for his son. And how about a little recommended listening, Captain? Mm -hmm. We have our show that you can check out. People always ask us, where can I find...